Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, thanks to the, the, um, the friends of Thomas Muir, the Eastern Barton District Council and Douglas Academy, of course, and it's, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I'm gonna do today is uh, talk about what, what perhaps for, for people is, is a, a rather dull subject, the law, but is the, the law, specifically the law of sedition that links John McLean and Thomas Muir. And the history of sedition in Scots law is, is a fascinating history, it's not a terribly well-known history. So I'm gonna explain something of the legal background and then look at the two trials uh, in, in, uh, and the significance of the trials. So let me get this right. So I hope uh, people can read, uh, this is, uh, Roddy was just talking about the dominance of text. I've got a lot of text here, but I'm a lawyer, so that's, that's what we do. Um, so I'll start off by I want to say something about the rise and fall of sedition in Scots law. Sedition uh, was in fact created by the High Court in 1793. So there was no crime of sedition before 1793 when the law of sedition was used to, to prosecute the, the Scottish radicals. Um, in, I'll say a little bit about you know, how that happened and the, and, and the background to that, but essentially the, the, the career of sedition, the, the law of sedition spans uh, the, the trial of, of, of Thomas Muir in 1793 and John McLean in 1918. Sedition uh, was used in only 23 trials between 1793 and 1848. Uh, these were the only trials for sedition in, in Scots law, and they were used at various moments of political unrest, so against the Chartists and so on was the last trial in, in 1848. There was a brief revival of, tradition, uh, of sedition in, in 1918 to 1921, where we see some sedition-related trials, and I'll explain how it's not properly sedition uh, uh, for various reasons. And then the, the crime of sedition almost uniquely was abolished by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act, Scotland, 2010. Uh, so sedition, it's, it's a crime with, with a very definite uh, lifespan, uh, and it encompasses, as I say, the, it begins with Thomas Muir and, and ends with uh, John McLean, virtually. So what is sedition, then? Uh, as I said a moment ago, there was, there, there was no law of sedition in Scotland before 1793. There were various political crimes such as treason, uh, which uh, would uh, encompass various kinds of rebellion against the crown or against the um, political institutions, but sedition itself was unknown. In England, there was a well-known law of seditious libel, which was used against various forms of speech or published word that were critical of uh, the established government. But uh, seditious libel was only a misdemeanor. It wasn't a serious crime, and so it wasn't, it, and it wasn't subject then to the most serious uh, penalties. It was, and it was used extensively in, in England in the, the 1790s against political radicals. But as political radicalism was growing in Scotland in the 1790s, the Lord Advocate, Robert Dundas of Arneson, a sort of famous figure, uh, was trying to take the initiative and so brought prosecutions for, for sedition against the, Sc the, the Scottish radicals following the collapse of some treason trials in, in London, in, in England. So they were trying to invent this, the, the Scottish law of tradition. Uh, in doing so, they were relying on a power which was claimed by the High Court of Justiciary to create crimes or declare crimes. So the, the, the High Court of Justiciary claimed it had a power if something was properly criminal, they could declare it to be so, even though it wasn't, hadn't been named in the law before that. And that was effectively the process that was going on uh, in, with the, the, the law of sedition. So up on the, the slide here, and I'd be happy to circulate the slides afterwards if people want, so you don't have to worry about taking photos or, write, or, or, or notes. Uh, th there's a definition of sedition from uh, Baron Hume, Baron David Hume is the nephew of the philosopher who's regarded as the founder of modern Scots criminal law. And he describes sedition in the following terms, as all those practices, whether by deed, word, writing, or whatsoever kind, which are suited and intended to disturb the tranquility of the state. 
moving his sub majesty's subjects to the dislike, resistance, or subversion of the established government or laws. And this was book, in a book published in 1797, which is to say after the sedition trials. It, sedition was not defined prior to 1797. And what's important about this, the definition we see here, is dislike, resistance, or subversion of government. Now, subversion is one thing, resistance another thing, dislike is very, very general. <laughs> Who doesn't dislike the government, right? Uh, and also, by deed, word, or writing, or, or whatsoever other activity. So it's, it's very, very broadly cast. Um, so it, 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 as we'll see in, when we look at the, the, the trial of, of Thomas Muir, the, this breadth is, is important. Importantly also, since the declaratory, the declaratory power was claimed by the High Court, um, the, high, the sentencing powers of the High Court were unlimited. So of, of all the courts in Scotland, this, this is still the case, the, the sentencing powers of the High Court are, are, are unlimited. So if something was, uh, found, if someone was found to be guilty of a crime in the High Court, there were, again, as we'll see, the, the potential penalties could be extremely high. Now, before the trial of Thomas, Thomas Muir in, in, in 1793, the, there have been um, six prosecutions uh, for sedition before that, so sort of testing the water, as you like, against minor people who were, were publishing or holding meetings, publishing books, holding meetings, uh, pamphlets, uh, and so on. And in all of these cases, there had been minor penalties imposed. Or indeed, the authorities, if the person had fled, the authorities had just not bothered following it up. So if the, if the person ran away and never didn't bother showing up for trial, then that was the end of the story. And in a sense, that's the way that sedition worked in libel, it, uh, seditious, seditious libel worked in, in England. If people, it was, it was about stopping people talking. So if people went away, left the country, or in other, you know, or the books were confiscated, or the printing press was confiscated, that was, you didn't need to do any more because it was a, cutting off the, 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 the words or the deed uh, at source, and that's what was happening initially in Scotland. But we see with the trial of Thomas Muir that things changed quite dramatically. So the trial of Thomas Muir then in 1793 took place at the High Court in Edinburgh on the 30th and 31st of August uh, 1793, and it was presided over by Lord Justice Clark Braxfield, the senior judge. Uh, at the time when the court sat, uh, it sat uh, now, if you were uh, try, if you're tried in the High Court of Justice, it would be a single judge and a jury. Uh, at the time, the judge, the court sat as a, a full bench, so there were uh, 12 or 13 judges there, and McBraxfield was the, the, the senior judge in this trial. Also, interestingly, and, and, and this is something that people, not many people know, is uh, it's unusual this trial lasted over two days. Most trials only lasted one day, because once, once the, the court was convened, it had to sit continuously. So actually, in the case of uh, the trial of Thomas Muir, they convened, the court convened about 10 o'clock in the morning. They sat continuously until 2 o'clock in the morning when Thomas Muir finished his speech. And unusually, the jury were allowed to go home, have a sleep, and they came back the, the following day to deliver their, their verdict. In most cases, and, and, and this is you know, up until quite late in, in the 19th century, they would sit continuously, so a trial would be a single day, and the jury would deliver their verdict at the end without retiring, but they must have been exhausted. So, so the trial sat continuously. Thomas Muir, uh, as, as you probably know, was then charged with making a series of, a series of allegedly seditious activities, making speeches, encouraging people to purchase seditious writings, uh, uh, distributing seditious writings. The seditious writings were the right uh, were principally Thomas Paine's *The Rights of Man* which had already, in England, been declared a seditious writing and a trial in absentia. So it was regarded as a seditious writing. So Thomas, it was alleged that he distributed this uh, or recommended it to people. And one of the witnesses uh, tells a story of it, he, him having a... <laughs> a, a copy, he, he had a copy of the book in his greatcoat pocket uh, and uh, and uh, the, the witness removed the copy from the, the great coat pocket, uh, pocket and could sh so he could share it with somebody else. So this was the, 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 the book that was at the, the, the center of things. The meetings were between 17, uh, November 1792 and January 1793. 
uh, in Kirkintilloch, Milton of Campsie, uh, and, and uh, in, in Glasgow. And Muir was convicted and sentenced to 14 years transportation. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. The trial is famous uh, for Thomas Muir's uh, address to the jury. Uh, it's a, a lengthy address, and, and this one of the similarities between the trial of John McLean and, and Thomas Muir is that in both trials, the accused person took the opportunity to, to make a, a, a lengthy address um, to the jury. So uh, we've already had some of the quotes from, uh, from, from uh, the, his, his address. Uh, just briefly here, I rise in my own defense. All that malice could devise, all that slander could circulate has been directed against me. I speak with joy and with triumph. To this day, I looked forward with expectation when before you, in the presence of Scotland, I should not merely remove the suspicion of guilt, but should demonstrate my innocency. The eyes of this country are fixed upon us both. The records of this trial will pass down to posterity. When our ashes shall be scattered by the winds of heaven, the impartial voice of future times will rejudge your verdict. And then in the report of the trial, it says, when Mr. Muir sat down, a unanimous burst of applause was expressed by the audience. What's notable about Thomas, Thomas Muir's trial is he conducted his own defense. He was an advocate, uh, as we know. Uh, and he conducted his defense in an able way. He challenged the composition of the jury. He challenged the relevancy of the charges. Uh, he cross-examined witnesses. He led a number of defense witnesses uh, to, to try and establish his, his innocence. And then, of course, he made his address to the jury. But all the time, as he was doing this, he was fighting against the resistance of the judiciary, in particular, Lord Braxfield. Now, Braxfield is a somewhat notorious character uh, in Scots law. Uh, he's Scotland's very own uh, hanging judge. Um, and it, it, there's a number of anecdotes about you know, how fond uh, Braxfield was of uh, imposing the death penalty. And he is allegedly the model for um, the, the Weir of Hermiston, the judge in Weir of Hermiston, who condemns his, his own son. And throughout the trial, Braxfield is, makes a num you know, number of comments which you know, he's, he's uh, essentially uh, telling Thomas Muir that, you know, the, that he, he, he's testing the patience of the court, that he's making points he shouldn't be making, and so on. In his direction to the jury, I've put up some quotes from it here. And th I think the key passage is this one. He asks, is the panel guilty of sedition or is he not? Now, before this question can be answered, two things must be attended to that require no proof. First, that the British Constitution is the best that ever there was since the creation of the world. <laughs> and it is not possible to make it better. <laughs> the next circumstance is that there was a spirit of sedition in this country last winter. Yet Mr. Muir had at that time gone about among ignorant country people. He, so he went on, the tendency of the panel's conduct was plainly to promote a spirit of revolt. His lordship had not the smallest doubt that the jury were, like himself, convinced of the panel's guilt and desired them to return such a verdict as, as would do them honor. So what's important about this is he was essentially telling the jury that the writings were seditious, the activities were seditious. He was telling the jury that, that they, had, they should return a verdict of guilty. Uh, also, I think what's crucial here is, is this, the, the, sec, the, sorry, it's the third paragraph up there where uh, Braxfield is saying he went about the, 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 the country and he, he had gone about among ignorant country people. And what was the real crime here uh, is that not that uh, Muir, as an educated man, uh, a man who by that time was bourgeois, a member of the bourgeoisie, uh, is not that he was reading Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, because Thomas Paine's Rights of the Rights of Man was a sensation amongst the, the middle classes and the, the upper classes in Edinburgh. Everyone was reading it. The, the problem was that he was sharing it with the servants, with the ignorant people. That was the crime, because these were the people who, did, who wouldn't know what to do with it, who would have some sort of intemperate reaction to it. And so for, for Braxfield, that, that was uh, one, of the, one of the important things at issue. 
So the trial was widely criticized. Uh, the, the most famous uh, critic of the trials uh, is, was Lord Henry Coburn, who uh, became a judge, um, who, who was alive in the 1790s, who became a judge in, in the early uh, 1800s and, and wrote very famous uh, memoirs, memorials of his time, but also wrote a, a posthumously published uh, book about the, 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 the sedition trials uh, in Scotland. Uh, but there were, there were a number of contem you know, contemporary critics as well, and, and the different aspects of the trial uh, were criticized. Um, briefly, uh, and I'm happy to talk about any, any more of these if, if anybody uh, would like me to say more about them. Uh, one of the issues was jury packing. The, 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 the jury of 15 were selected from a group known as Goldsmiths Hall who were uh, resistant to the idea of any criticism of the government uh, and who had already specifically condemned uh, Thomas Muir as being seditious. And when Muir tried to pr uh, protest against the swearing in of the jury, uh, he, was, he was essentially brushed aside. In fact, interestingly, one of the jury members themselves tried to uh, recuse himself from the trial, and he was told that he was not allowed to recuse himself from the trial uh, by, by Lord Braxfield. The evidence against Muir was very weak. Uh, it's essentially, you know, the, 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 the crown case was that uh, these were seditious activities that, that Muir was advocating the overthrow of the government, but most of the, 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 the prosecution witnesses uh, were very clear that Muir had, had at no point made statements of that kind, that he was advocating constitutional reform. He wasn't trying to overthrow the Constitution, he was trying to reform the Constitution, and the Crown witnesses uh, established that. There was uh, criticism of the meaning of sedition itself. What was sedition? Uh, it was, uh, you know, what kind of criticism was allowed? And, the, and the, this was never specified by the court. So, so that, you know, it, the, 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 the official position to, seemed to be that some sort of criticism was allowed, but not this kind. And as I say, it, what was the, the, the undertone of the trial was that it was sharing these, uh, these seditious ideas with ignorant people rather than sharing it with members of the, the, uh, the upper classes. In fact, Lord Coburn, in, in his book about the sedition trials, uh, notes that at, at the time, even the Dundas family were, were reading Thomas Paine's Rights of Man as a family in their, their parlor uh, in the 1790s, uh, but not in the presence, obviously, uh, of the servants. Uh, clearly, there was judicial partiality. Uh, Braxfield's role in, in, in not being independent was criticized. And of course, the sentence was criticized as being excessive. In fact, being, being unexpectedly excessive, and one of the interesting things here is the jury, apparently, and this is, a, a, again, a, an anecdote told by um, Coburn, the jury, uh, when the sentence of transportation for 14 years was passed, the jury apparently uh, protested to the court and said they, they had expected uh, a, a sentence of imprisonment for three months or a fine or something similar. And uh, they were taken aback by the the. the the, the, the severity uh, of, of the sentence. But again, uh, they, they, they were then told that um, there had been sort of political unrest, uh, a, a messenger had been attacked somewhere, in, in, a legal messenger had been attacked uh, somewhere in, in Glasgow, and that therefore the jury then withdrew and they said, well, the, the, the times are such that uh, severe sentences are required. But the, 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 certainly the, 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 um, the severity of the sentence was, was widely criticized. But we see, sadly, many of these same uh, themes being uh, repeated in the trial uh, of John McLean, which is what I want to come to now. Now, what's interesting about, well, there's many interesting things about the trial of John McLean, um, but uh, McLean was not, although uh, it's, it's, it's said that he was tried for sedition, uh, and, and convicted of sedition. Actually, he wasn't. And this is uh, maybe, me being maybe a little bit legalistic here. Um, he was convicted under the Defense of the Realm Acts uh, rather than under the common law of sedition, which is, is what Thomas Muir had been convicted of. The Defense of the Realm Acts were a series of statutes that were passed on the, out, the outbreak of war from 1914 uh, onwards. And they what the, the initial Defense of the Realm Act, uh, which was passed in 1914, was 
to support the war effort. And one of the really draconian things with the, that the Defense of the Realm Act did was it suspended jury trial, the first uh, Defense of the Realm Act. Said that there will be no jury trial. Anybody breaking, any, being tried under any of the offenses in the Defense of the Realm's regulations, it said, had to be tried by marshal, courts martial. So it was a suspension uh, of jury trial. There were eventually protests against this. And in 1915, the Defense of the Realm Amendment Act was passed that, uh, that reinstated civil uh, trial, that's to say, you know, trial in the, the normal criminal courts uh, for people breaking the, the regulations. The Defense of the Realm Act uh, created uh, essentially a kind of overarching power. Then Defense of the Realm regulations uh, could be created by the authority of the Act. And the Defense of the Realm regulations covered a, a wide range of things, from uh, prohibiting the flying of kites, prohibiting dog shows, which is obviously very important to the war effort, um, to uh, the, one, the one we all know about is, is introducing licensing hours for the first time, so where pubs had to close at, at, at about 10 o'clock. Um, that they also, there were regulations about drug use for the first time, you know, uh, use of cocaine and, uh, and, and morphine, um, and also mutiny and sedition. And so the important one here is Regulation 42, which I put on the slide. And that says, if any person attempts or does any act calculated or likely to cause mutiny, sedition, or disaffection among any of Her Majesty's for His Majesty's forces, sorry, or amongst the civilian population, he shall be guilty of an offense against these regulations. So what's important about this, it's linking mutiny, sedition, and disaffection and amongst the military or the civilian population. So it's primarily directed at uh, activities that would be interfering with war production processes, the munition factories, or, uh, into, or encouraging mutiny uh, amongst the armed forces, and also, crucially, the civilian um, population. So John McLean then had a number of uh, run-ins with the Defenses of the Realm Act, um, so that the, his trial in 1918 was not by any means his first. So uh, he was charged for the first time in October 1915 with uttering statements which were prejudicial to recruitment, and he was sentenced to five pounds fine or five days imprisonment. He was charged again in February 1916 uh, with offenses under the Defenses of the Realm Act, inducing others to obstruct the war effort, and he was sentenced to three years penal servitude and was released in January 1917. And it was following his release in January 1917 that he then engaged in the various activities which were to give rise to the charge in, or the trial in May 19, 1918, uh, when he was charged with making statements likely to prejudice the recruiting, training, and discipline of His Majesty's forces and to cause mutiny, sedition, and disaffection among the civilian population. And he'd made these statements at a number of public meetings in Lanarkshire between January and April 1918. What kind of statements was he making? Well, the statements, if you've read his um, speech at the trial, the statements are uh, not unfamiliar. He was arguing that workers should down their tools, should break all laws, establish their own. They should seize the food supply. There was plenty of food in Glasgow, he said, uh, and that, that the workers should seize it for themselves. Uh, they should profit or learn from the experience of workers in Russia. They should overthrow their common enemy and seize the pits, the land, the factories, and abolish class. And that they should stri strike the first blow for revolution on May the 1st, uh, 1918. So these are the, the, the kind of I mean, there were lengthy speeches. These are the kinds of statements that, that he was making. And as Tom uh, pointed out earlier, there were uh, various police witnesses, uh, police constables, special constables at the, at the various meetings. He was being tracked, essentially, by the authorities at this point. And the, the, they, were, they were giving remarkably, um, the, you know, they were claiming to give sort of, you know, the verbatim accounts of what he said, but none of them had taken any contemporaneous notes. Uh, and this is something perhaps familiar from other, uh, other police witnesses, police testimony at other trials. 
uh, as well. So the trial itself then was held in Edinburgh, and uh, it's, it's in the High Court in Edinburgh. The High Court obviously could uh, go on circuit. It could be, uh, can sit in, in a number of different places. I think it's probably significant it was held in Edinburgh rather than in Glasgow. It's away from John McLean's um, home, his, his uh, power base, if you like. And presiding was Lord Justice General Strathclyde, who had been the same judge as in the 1916 trial. McLean conducted his own defense, but unlike the previous trial, in his 1916 trial, uh, he'd, uh, he'd actually entered a full defense. He, he, he used the lawyer, uh, and his lawyer had led the defense for him and, and questioned witnesses uh, and such like. In, in, in the 1918 uh, trial, he refused to plead initially, which, uh, so he, when he was asked to plead, do you plead not guilty or not guilty? He refused to plead. The court took that as a plea of not guilty. Um, and then McLean was essentially not challenging any of the, the witnesses, the accounts of the witnesses, and he didn't lead any uh, witnesses on his own, in his own behalf, in his own defense. The evidence was almost entirely from uh, police and special constables, uh, people who had attended the meetings and, as I said earlier, gave these sus suspiciously verbatim accounts. Uh, Clyde uh, KC, who was prosecuting, concluded when he was addressing the jury by saying that political discussion was permitted, and here I quote, but there came a point at which discussion of socialistic questions or discussion of any question changed its character. Here, there were deliberate and persistent attempts to plant seeds of disloyalty, sedition, and mutiny. And it was an incitement to active violence and rebellion. And the jury convicted McLean without retiring, and he was sentenced to five years penal servitude. The trial is famous, of course, for McLean's uh, speech. Um, and uh, I, we've already heard some extracts from it, so I, I, I'll save time by not going through the aspects of his speech. He spoke for about 75 minutes. Um, which is probably about as long as uh, it seems that Clyde uh, was speaking, Casey was speaking for as well. But it was followed then by uh, a, a very brief uh, direction to the jury um, from Lord Strathclyde, uh, in which Lord Strathclyde simply said, a question of simple fact was submitted to the jury. Whether on the 11 different occasions mentioned in the indictment, the accused made the statements alleged no attempt had been made by the defense to, not, to deny that the statements had been made. So essentially what Lord Strathclyde was doing was he was not saying the, the, whether or not the statements were seditious or not was not an issue. He was, it was simply a question of fact. Did he make these statements or did he not make the statements? And since he had not denied making the statements, there'd been no defense. Then he was essentially di again directing the jury to convict here. John McLean's uh, relationship, if you like, with the Defense of the Realm Acts did not change uh, after his conviction uh, in 1918. He was released, as we know, in November of 1918. In May of 1921, he was tried in the Sheriff Court in Airdrie on 11 counts. Again, it appears of incitement and sedition, this time under powers created by the, the Emergency Powers Act 1920, which was replacing the Defense of the Realm Act, uh, and was sentenced to three months' imprisonment and was released in August 1921. He was rearrested in September 1921 and charged with sedition related offenses again in the Glasgow Sheriff Court, sentenced to 12 months' imprisonment. He was then released on the 25th of October 1922, and then he had his final. Uh, run in with the law in April of 1923 when he was convicted of breach of the peace in the Glasgow Sheriff Court uh, for having organized protests against a cinema which had refused to hold uh, political meetings with certain um, speakers, the cinema in Govan. He was fined, but he, re he refused to pay, and at, by this point, the authorities just, just left it. They, 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 they didn't attempt to enforce the payment. They didn't 
uh, seek to imprison him. Of course, by this time, he was already uh, quite a sick man, and he died later that year. So what can we say then about sedition in the trials of John McLean? I mean, the first thing to say, is, is, as is obvious, is there was a clear campaign against McLean. The authorities were emboldened by the earlier successes, and the penalties were gradually increased. But the decisions to prosecute him, in each, in each case, were political decisions. So the Lord Advocate was not acting, if you like, on his own initiative. He was consulting with uh, people in Westminster. He was consulting with the, the Scottish political class and trying to decide what was the, 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 the best thing to do. So the law was clearly explicitly being used to try and uh, address the threat that was seen to be posed by, by John McLean. Clearly, also, there was collusion between the witnesses. Uh, there may have been fabrication of the witness, witness uh, statements. The problem, of course, was how to challenge that. McLean had initially tried in 1916 to challenge some of the evidence, to challenge the, 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 the witnesses, to, you know, to say that his think, statements he'd been made had been taken out of context, that they weren't giving the full, con you know, the, the full uh, context of the speech. Uh, in, in which he'd been given to cherry-picking certain phrases, and that the meaning would be seen differently if it was seen in, in, in the more general context of the, the speech that, that he'd been given. But these, uh, in 1916, these, his, his, these arguments were rejected. Uh, and by 1918, when he was tried for sedition, uh, it seems that he regarded the trial more as an opportunity to deliver a speech from the, the dock than to... Uh, than to try and run a, a legal defense. So he wasn't trying to challenge the law in, in this instance. Oh, sorry, I'm going, rushing ahead of myself. Uh, he, was, uh, the, he was tried under the defense of the Realm Act rather than under the common law. Uh, trying, using the defense of the Realm Act Convey, clearly conveys the sense of there being an emergency. And so this, these were special circumstances which required some sort of um, special response. So these were emergency powers then. But crucially also, the meaning of sedition was still informed by common law understandings uh, of what sedition was. And sedition uh, in, in, in the common law had evolved by this time, so that it meant not criticism alone that there the was... It, Fair, you know, crit legitimate criticism of, of governments was allowed, but where there was incitement to violence or incitement to overthrow, that would amount, constitute sedition uh, in Scots law. And as I've, I've already covered the final point here, the, but it, it, it's worth stressing that the authorities were keen, uh, in a different way from Braxfield in, in the trial of Thomas Muir, the authorities in the trial, uh, in the trial of John McLean were keen to depoliticize in a way. The, the, for the jury, the question is, is not deciding what is or is not legitimate criticism, what is or is not permitted under law. It was simply a factual question. Did McLean make these statements or did he not? And if he did, that amounted to sedition. And that marks, a, a, again, a kind of shift in the way that the, the law of sedition uh, was being used. So finally then, uh, a, a few remarks on uh, the end of sedition. Uh, and, and the, if you like, the life of sedition uh, in Scots law. The first point, I, I'll take the second point uh, here for second bullet point um, first. Sedition was increasingly defined in terms of incitement to crime or to political violence. So a, a significant change between, say, 1790 and, and, and 1848 even, and then later 1918, was that sedition was not understood in terms of as being any kind of criticism or dislike of the government, uh, as Hume would have had it in his original definition. In order to amount to sedition, it had to be something that would light the fires of violence, something that would incite people to do something. So it had to be a kind of active language. And in some of the writings about sedition, it's, it's uh, making political speeches is, is, is said, is, criticism is fine, but if you scatter sparks, then you, you create a fire, 
if you're creating that risk of fire, that, that would amount to sedition. So sedition is, the, the definition of sedition is being narrowed somewhat from its original uh, form uh, in, in the 1790s. But at the same time as that, sedition as a crime was rarely being prosecuted. So as I said, there were 23 prosecutions between 1793 and 1848, which isn't much, but then only three or four more in the, the period between 19... 18 and, and 1922. And interestingly, the final trial for sedition in Scots Law was a prosecution of a man called Guy Aldred, who was a comrade of, uh, an anarchist, a comrade of, of John Muir's, who actually wrote a pamphlet about John Muir uh, in the 1930s uh, as well. So the, there's a kind of connections here um, uh, uh, as well. But the authorities were reluctant, generally, to try people for sedition because it gave people a political platform. Why, you, you were giving people the opportunity to make a speech for an hour to reach an audience, that, a, a wider audience. Um, and the authorities, in a sense, had wised up. Political protest was policed in a different way, so that rather than having a confrontation you know, between uh, the, the military and, and, and a crowd and, and, and the, the, the speakers, the police would arrest a few people they saw as the ringleaders they would take them away, they would remove them from the scene. And they had realized that it was much more effective in dealing with political protest to downplay it, to, to take people away, to, to, to stop the confrontation arising than to give the political platform or to create political martyrs. So we talk about the martyrdom of Thomas Muir and John McLean and of course the other Scottish political martyrs. But there was a clear conscious decision on the part of the authorities to try and avoid creating martyrs, uh, really after, the, after 1848, and that was distinctive. So what can we say about sedition then more generally? Lord Coburn, who I've already mentioned, described sedition as a crime of a more orderly age, uh, and what he meant by that was that uh, as society became more orderly, it became possible to have a different kind of political discussion, a different kind of political debate, um, but that the crime of sedition, as he understood it, and his, his sort of modern liberal understanding, was the intemperate orator, the, the, the person who gave a speech that scattered the sparks that potentially incited people to violence, and that he saw that age, uh, the, the, after the 1790s, after the trial, and particularly the 1820s, saw that age being ushered in where the scope of sedition would be much more limited. Of course, we are now in a different kind of orderly age. Um, and as I said, Scot sedition has been abolished in, in Scots law. It's been replaced by other things. There are other crimes which are used, you know, and, and public order offenses are used. In other countries, in, uh, uh, sedition is still widely used, and there's a big debate currently in, in India, for example, about the law of sedition also in Russia and in uh, some Eastern European countries. So, so we can congratulate ourselves on the removal of sedition and the creation of, if you like, an orderly age in Scotland. But that doesn't mean that we should be unaware of its continuing political importance. So thank you very much. <laughs>